Praise God. And that is our prayer of this Advent. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, the one who was born to set his people free, free from fears, free from sin, free from injustice, and from oppression. Christ, our liberator, savior, deliverer, who comes to us as a meek baby. What an image. What good news. Would you pray with me? Holy God, you are the one whose constant presence gives rise to our hope. Here we are, listening with the ears of our hearts for the ways in which you are calling to us now, calling upon our lives. We are here now, God, with building anticipation, awaiting your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be a delight to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. And it's in the matchless name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, beloved, here we are once again. Advent is upon us. The beginning is here. Advent, this liturgical season of anticipation and preparation for the coming of Christ once again. We eagerly await for Christ's arrival in our hearts, and we join Christians throughout the world and throughout the centuries to pray that Christ will come again in our world to bring about his final victory so that our worldly suffering may cease and we can live eternally as our full selves in the kingdom of God that God is building even now among us. Well, we know that this season of anticipation brings more than just a building excitement about the coming of Christ. This is also the season of year-end business and year-end busyness. Many of us have moved fully into crunch time, if not getting there soon for the final papers that are coming and year-end reports that have to get done and those year-end sales that have to be made. And there is so much rushing around this time of year, as some of us are hustling just to make ends meet, while some of us are anxiously thinking we need to hustle to make ends meet. And this is a season of anticipated joy and celebration, but with it also comes anticipated grief and sorrow for many of us. The season of Advent will have a different meaning for some of us this year. Rather than preparing for Christmas with our beloveds, we are preparing our hearts to endure a holiday season without a departed loved one. Maybe it's the first time, or maybe it's the 50th time, but grief is going to do what grief is going to do. It's going to surprise us. It's going to ache within us, and it will bless us with the reminder of how much we miss and love those who have gone on to glory. So this morning, I want to just take a moment to slow down. I want to give us a little bit of breathing room. And I want to move our focus for just a moment on our Advent candle. A single candle, shining the light of God, lit by this beloved community. And if we listen closely, we can hear life happening around us. We might even be able to hear that light rain falling, or we might hear God whispering a word of comfort to us even now. I love this tradition of the church to light candles during Advent because the nights are growing longer and longer and the darkness of the world feels like it continues to, gr to grow. But we light a candle to remind ourselves that the light of God remains, is present, it radiates. A soul candle glowing warmly, glowing meekly, disrupting the darkness. As the gospel writer said, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There is a simplicity to this good news that encourages our hearts and inspires some hope, even in the darkest night. 
when grief swallows up our energy, when injustice is taking our breath away, when we are going numb just to survive, when despair seems like our only companion. No matter the amount or depth of gloom, the good news of Advent is that the light of God is always shining in the darkness. God's presence cannot be stolen away from us. God's love cannot be overcome. And so this Advent brings an invitation to slow down, to take some time to listen to life, because the busyness will continue to overwhelm us, and the grief will continue to be a companion in this journey. And so the single candle inspires us to hope that the light of God will shine in those seasons and in those places and through those people that we thought it would have been impossible to do so. Indeed, our theme this Advent is grounded in today's scripture. Nothing is impossible. Yes, nothing is impossible with God. These are the last glorious words said by the angel Gabriel to Mary of Nazareth in this scene of the Annunciation. This moment when the good news of Christ's incarnation comes first to this poor, teenage, Palestinian Jewish girl under Roman occupation who would soon be named Mother of God incarnate. These words are the answer to a question, how? To which Gabriel can only respond, yes. Nothing is impossible with God. These words are a comfort to us who have our backs against the wall, when the only apparent options are fight, flight, or freeze, with no clear pathway to life. Well, nothing is impossible with God, because I heard it said that God makes a way out of no way, beloved. Because when one door closes, God will open up another door. Or when that door gets slammed shut, God will open a window. And if it turns out that, in fact, you are in a prison cell, God will come in and throw open the doors and break down the walls so that you will be truly free. Because God will speak, and those walls will come tumbling down. Because nothing is impossible with God, beloved. So over the next four weeks, we are going to ground ourselves in this Advent promise and proclamation. And it is fitting that we begin with hope, because hope is the posture of possibility. Hope is how we orient ourselves to the predicament of life, positioning ourselves so that our creative and loving God will see to it that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Because you see, hope is a posture, meaning that it is about how we position ourselves toward God, toward one another, and toward this world. Hope is about how we prepare ourselves to respond to what this world may throw at us. Hope is this posture of possibility. It's an orientation towards the dead ends and the tight spots and the complex problems. Because hope is putting ourselves into that head space and that heart space to perceive what new things God can and will do among us. And it's this kind of hope that we find exemplified in Mary of Nazareth. Here is this young woman, thoughtful, curious, a dreamer. She had her own hopes and dreams surely for herself and for her family, but she also had big dreams for her people. She had dreams about the Messiah who would come to save her people from their oppression and recreate God's kingdom. But I wonder how much she imagined she would figure into that plan. Did she know intuitively at a young age that God would call God's people to be an integral part of this saving work of the world? That, that God's people would have to be part of giving birth to God's kingdom? I wonder, did she understand that the Messiah wasn't coming to save us from holy work, but instead empowering us to do that holy work, to join in God's creative and liberating movement in the world? I wonder if Mary perceived already that God's saving work is more about awakening us to the latent power within us, that Imago Dei, image of God. Well, maybe she did, or maybe she didn't, but what we do know from the text is that she is indeed filled with hope about what God is able to do in and through her. And this is itself a miracle. When considering the story of Mary of Nazareth, many tend to wonder, why was she chosen for this task? To be the Theotokos, this word meaning the God-bearer, the mother of God incarnate. And over the centuries, there has been much theological speculation and many traditions that come with it developing uh, from the first Christ followers that never quite made it into scripture to try to answer this question. 
But we really only need to look at this story to see why Mary would be chosen for such a task as this. Here is this young woman at home, maybe late at night, deep in thought. I imagine she's busy doing some housework, doing some chores, and all the while she's listening closely, as she always does, listening for the Spirit of God. And then suddenly there shines a great light. Maybe it was in the room or maybe it was just in her heart. And from that light speaks the great angel Gabriel, rejoice, highly favored one. God is with you. Blessed are you among women. And Mary's response is truly amazing. She does not cower away in fright as we see some do in scripture. She does not shrink from this divine light speaking to her. Instead, she takes the whole experience very seriously. And she approaches it with divine curiosity. She wonders what this greeting might mean for her. And already we see her as a person of hope, this person postured towards new possibilities. She does not dismiss the experience, but is open to what God might indeed be saying to her. She is full of faith and full of hope. And so the angel Gabriel responds to her openness and tells her the good news of what is to come that she will indeed conceive and bear a son, and he will be called Jesus, Yeshua, which means Yahweh saves. And this son will be God's only begotten and the one who will uh, save her people, the one for whom her people have been waiting. And her response once again is full of hope, open to what God is really doing in her midst. And she does not disregard these words from God. She does not shrink from this calling. Instead, she inquires further with a logistical question. How can this be? This sounds impossible. I've never been with a man, but I am open to what God has to say. And so again, the angel responds with a spiritual vision of what will take place, that, that there will be a powerful movement of the Holy Spirit within her that will give rise to a saving and liberating and life-giving word of God. And how does she know that this can happen? Well, Gabriel points to something that's already happening in her midst, pointing to the way that God is moving even now, that her cousin Elizabeth will have a child even in her old age, just like Sarah and Abraham. Beloved, God is not finished speaking, and God has yet a word to speak, indeed a word to give birth to within us. And so Mary of Nazareth, the proclaimed to be Theotokos, the bearer of the divine word of God himself, gives voice to the hope that is within her. I am the servant of God. Let it be done within me, just as you say. Mary exemplifies for us the power of hope, because it all started with an openness to God's continued work in the world today, because after all, nothing is impossible with God. And so this Advent, we will be invited each week to concrete spiritual practices. And so as a practice of hope, we are invited to follow in the way of Mary of Nazareth, the mother of God incarnate. Because I do not know how God spoke through Gabriel to her, whether it was aloud in an audible voice or if it was within her heart. But I do know that today God is still speaking if we are only open to listen to what God has to say. So this week, we are invited to the practice of sacred listening. It may feel impossible to take 10 minutes for prayer, or may feel impossible to even approach the throne of God in our grief and despair. But sometimes prayer is less about speaking, and it's more about listening. Listening with the ears of our hearts for what God is trying to speak into our lives. This practice of listening can happen wherever you are, no matter what you are doing. Just take a breath. Remember that God can speak and is speaking through your experience. And God's grace might just be opening up new possibilities for you, even now. This is how we listen for hope, like Mary of Nazareth. And who knows, maybe that word from God will deeply trouble us. <laughs> and it may cause us to wonder, just like Mary. And God will remind us that we are indeed blessed. You are blessed. Blessed, beloved, blessed of the Most High God, bearers of the divine image made in the image of God.
So as we think about sacred listening, I turn to the mystic, the great mystic Howard Thurman, who meditated about sacred listening, and particularly how God speaks to the sound of the genuine. We hear these words from Howard Thurman. There is in every person something that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine. There is in you something that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine within yourself. Nobody like you has ever been born, and no one like you will ever be born again. You are the only one. The sound of the genuine is flowing through you. Do not be deceived and thrown off by all the noises that are part of even your dreams and your ambitions when you're not listening to the sound of the genuine within you. Because that is the only true guide you will ever have, and if you don't have that, you don't have a thing. So cultivate the discipline of listening to the sound of the genuine within you. Now, if I hear the sound of the genuine in me, and I hear the sound of the genuine within you, it is possible for me to go down into my spirit and come up into your spirit so that when I look at myself through your eyes, having made that pilgrimage, I see in me what you see in me. Then the wall that separates and divides us will disappear and we will become one, because the sound of the genuine makes the same music. So beloved, let that be our practice. May we listen closely for God with the ears of our hearts for the sound of the genuine. And may we listen in a way that draws us more deeply into God's divine life that is offered to us each and every day, because God has not finished speaking. And indeed, God is speaking new possibilities for you and for all of us, even now. Let it be so. Thanks be to God. Amen.